The NYU Furman Center is um, a research organization that sits between NYU Law School and the Wagner School of Public Policy. We are a nonpartisan um, research institution focused on housing and urban policy. Um, so before we get into the mission statement, I want the team to introduce themselves. So Nikki, why don't we start yeah. with you? Hi, everybody. My name is Nikki Miller, and I'm the Data Management Associate at the Furman Center. Nice to meet you all today. Hi everyone, I'm Camille. I'm a graduate data researcher. The Furman Center has a lot of graduate students on part of the team, and so I'm one of those team members. Hi everyone, I'm Masaki. I work as a data assistant here um, in the data team. Hi everyone, I'm Jin Yu Li. I'm also a graduate data researcher in the Furman Center. Hi everyone, I'm Jiaxi. I used to be a graduate researcher at the Furman Center, <laughs> now I'm the data manager. Nice to meet you all. Jachi is the brainchild of, of so much of this. And we have to give a special acknowledgement to Brian uh, Brenner, who really kind of helped uh, lead and shepherd this. He is flying in the sky and can't be with us right now, but he uh, had a strong presence in helping shape uh, today's session. So our core mission at the, at the Furman Center is really to conduct objective and empirical research. Um, we're always trying to help elevate the debate in terms of public policy, especially around affordable housing, which as all of you know, is such a critical issue right now. Um, we do this by trying to promote frank and productive conversations, very much data driven, um, to help elected and public policy officials know exactly what um, they need to know in order to make the most effective decisions. And we do that by presenting essential um, data and analysis on the state of New York City's um, housing, and neighborhoods, and a big part of that is the platform that we're going to be introducing you all today with, with core data. Um, and then also training um, the next generation of urban policy leaders. Um, as you can tell from Jachi's growth at the Furman Center, we're constantly cultivating um, our graduate research ass assistants and um, trying to elevate their work. So with that, I will hand it over to my colleague. Yes. Yeah, so just a quick overview about core data. It's New York City's Housing and Neighborhoods Data Hub. Um, who are the users? The users include many different kinds of stakeholders, like policymakers, elected officials, um, advocacy groups, researchers, and residents themselves. And why do we use core data, or why should people use core data? It's like the only public um, property level database of subsidized housing in New York City. It pulls together data on demographics, real estate market, zoning, permits, um, flood zones, crime, schools, rent burdens, and more, and attracts new affordable housing construction as it is announced and built. And it also shows start and end dates of subsidies to highlight properties at risk of going market rate. And there are also like, it has history and other features of core data like in the uh, data dictionary section. And now speaking about like the history of core data, um, NYU Furman Center first launched the Subsidized Housing Information Project uh, in 2011, which was at the time a searchable database consolidated, which consolidated dozens of public and private data sources on cities subsidized properties. And then in 2016, it relaunched as core data with a new user um, friendly interface. So I'm going to pass it now to Masaki to speak more about core data. Thank you, Nikki. I'm going to go over three key features of a core data website. The first is the subsidized housing database. As Nikki mentioned, it's the only publicly available property level data on New York City's subsidized housing. And it, it includes almost every residential property with at least five or more units and has an active subsidy status. And this can be a rental subsidy or a tax credit. And I'll be going over this example on how the database is used on our website. Once you enter our website, you can choose any property that we have available data available on. And you can see here, we chose a property in Long Island City, 150 50 Avenue. And down below, under the regulatory tools, you can see which subsidy program it's under. This is under LIHTC 4%. And you can see more information on the start and end date and the agencies involved. Uh, moving on, if you want to learn more about these subsidy programs, we also have this directory of New York City housing program. This is a great resource to look up on any of the 200 city, state, and federal government programs on affordable housing. And the left sidebar you see here, you can filter based on categories or 
government agencies for any specific program. And lastly, yeah, the, the neighborhood data profiles, along with property level data, we have data on neighborhood levels. That, um, this includes, sorry. <laughs> demographics. Yeah, demographics, uh, housing markets, and land use. Uh, this is one example we have here in Woodside and Sunnyside. And what we have is neighborhood indicators data, as I just shown. And you can also the data, you can also download the data through the link on the right side. And we also include visualizations and simple summaries on the data itself. And with that, I'll pass it to Junie. Thanks, Masaki. Next, I will share some research findings we're utilizing the subsidized housing database underlying the core data NYC. According to previous research, we can tell that there is a high cost of the evictions, such as negative effect to the housing and labor market outcomes. However, there has been a surprisingly little scrutiny of evictions in the subsidized housing. To help you better understand, I'd like to talk more about the background about the evictions happening in New York State. A notice is served by the landlord, and if the tenant does not pay within the 14 days, the landlord may initiate a lawsuit then leading to a court hearing. Only if the judges rule in the landlord's favor, they will have an eviction warrant. Then the officer may go to remove their tenant. Importantly, we should notice that there are various rental assistance and evictions pre prevention programs in the New York State. So the eviction failings do not equal to an eviction situation. Based on all those contexts, our research compares the eviction patterns in different types of the location and different types of the housing program to observe whether the patterns vary across different market conditions. Unlike earlier work, we consider both the eviction filing rates and also the request for eviction, as I talked before. And during the data processing, we use the subsidized housing database from Core Data NYC to categorize the subsidized and unsubsidized among the many multifamily properties. I think the strength of the Core Data NYC is because it provides a very detailed building board building block lot level data, and also it includes details on the overlapping subsidies and their durations. <coughs> As a result, we could notice a variation in eviction actions across the developments in New York. This could be a strategy by housing authorities and owners to expect rent collections. We also observe that the managing desecration plays a significant role in how quickly the evictions are filed against tenants with the overdue rent. Those insights from the core data NYC could help us better understand the complex dynamics of the subsidized housing and evictions. All of those above could provide the policymakers with a grounded perspective to consider new strategies for preventing eviction and securing housing stability for the New Yorkers. Awesome. So with all that context, we're now going to pivot towards the workshop portion of today. We prepared a curated list of different data journeys that you all can kind of walk through that goes through the core data tools, the different data sets that are available, and gives you some guiding questions for topics you might want to explore. We've broken them down by level of experience with data analysis. So if you don't have programming experience or Excel experience, you can just play around with the tool itself. If you have Excel analysis experience, we have some ideas for how you could use the data, download it into Excel, and then manipulate it there. And then we also have some coding journeys that use R or Python with our core data to um, make further visualizations and analysis. So you can access the worksheet at this URL up here. 
which will then um, have all of the content and links you need to explore the journeys. And we're here to facilitate and help out if there are any questions. We're also gonna have time at the end for people to share out whatever they found or thought was interesting. And would also love to have feedback from you all on the tool itself at the end. So we also have paper versions if anyone needs and didn't bring a laptop for that. It might be better to stick to the, the core data NYC interface and the neighborhood data profiles. But um, let us know if you need that. We can walk around and give it to you, or you can feel free to come up. And like we said, we're all here for questions, so we're happy to, to walk through anything as you, as you go through the journeys. So I'll just walk through um, level one as an example, the mapping inclusionary zoning and income. Um, so with this journey, we're interested in looking at where um, buildings with inclusionary zoning have been built, and that's a specific policy tool that makes sure that new developments have a certain percentage of affordable units. And so we're interested in seeing how that correlates with surrounding income in those neighborhoods. So this is the, the overview when you enter Core Data, Core Data NYC, you'll see this landing page. And from here, if we want to map only inclusionary zoning units, we would navigate to um, the subsidized housing database tab. Here you have a bunch of options on how you can filter the data. The main way that we would do it for inclusionary zoning is to go to the subsidies. So to, to map to the subsidized um, property, different subsidies, you can go to the subsidies tab and we have the subsidy type um, drop down menu. And so if we're interested in um, inclusionary zoning, we'd go to program and filter to inclusionary zoning. We can also filter by year built, for example. So this journey was looking at the last 10 years. So we put in 2014 and save. And so now we have a map of the properties that have inclusionary zoning and were built in the last 10 years. And from here, it's pretty fun to kind of play around. You can click on every building that pops up. You can get detailed information on the building itself on um, the income targeted units. Like here we see that there's the actual breakdown, breakdown of what income targeted units are present, and then more information about the tools and programs that are um, used for that development. And so then from here, we can also add a layer on the map that looks at overall um, neighborhood um, income. So from, let me remind myself how we got there. So in the demographics tab, where is that? The second one. The second one, yes. Um, income and poverty, we have a bunch of different subsets here, but here for this journey we're looking at income diversity, for example. So the income diversity ratio measures um, how diverse incomes are in that particular area. And so now we have a core plus layer that shows us at different geographic levels, we can choose the city, for example, which isn't as intuitive here, the borough level breakdown, and the kind of geography you can see depends on the indicator often, but here, for example, the most granular we have is a sub-borough area. So then I think it's interesting to look at northern Brooklyn because we see that there's pretty high income diversity here and a lot in a cluster of inclusionary zoning properties. So from here, this is kind of the endpoint in the data journey where you then formulate some more hypotheses or questions about what you'd like to look into in specific properties or neighborhoods based on their demographics. Um, and to remind you all, there's a bunch of different layers you can do. The data journeys here are kind of a quick um, example, but you can play around with all the different available options and kind of make your own question as well. That's definitely welcome. So that's a quick overview. I don't know if anyone wanted to provide another example, but let us know if you have questions based on that. I know for those who can't access it, it might be, you can also come here and play around with it if you'd like, <laughs> that's an option. I do have a question, yeah. uh, more like, I guess like the content question, like inclusionary zoning, like what is that exactly? Is that like upzoning plus provisions for affordable housing or? It's so from my understanding it's new development has to be built in certain in certain zones new development will have to be built with a certain percentage of affordable units. So 
it's also a tool by which some developers will be able to increase what they build if they offer affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. kind of a carrot for developers to, to be able to develop in an area, get more density, get more units, mm -hmm. as long as they make some of them affordable. That's gotcha. usually. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering, I'm not sure if this like fits into um, the, the subsidized housing focus that you guys have, but would you guys like, also include, let's say like, the amount of homeless shelters in, in a borough or also like sanctuary housing yeah. um, like or domestic violence shelters, things like that? So I don't think Core Data has that data because we're focused on subsidized properties only. But I think that would be that's an essential that's an essential piece of data that we definitely need. I think maybe there are stuff out there by the the Department of Homeless Services. I haven't looked into it, but um, I don't think we have anything on Core Data that gets to homelessness. I know we have eviction as a as a measure here, but um, nothing on homelessness, which Maybe that could be something to ingrate in the future. Yeah, that's actually one of the feedback session questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I think 311 has some uh, reports on homelessness. Yeah. That's one of the. Complaints. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say complaint, right? But that's something that you can request. Yeah, that's yeah. true. You can find that here. Yeah. Another question: Are there any like other projects that you guys know of, like kind of like mapping homelessness or things like that? So we do have some like very high level indicators about like uh, month, average monthly shelter population by family status as a longitudinal um, bar chart in our state of the city report. Uh, so if we could look at, so uh, we, we, we refer to the data that is put publicly available by Department of Homeless Services on open data but also we look into a uh, coalition for the homelessness, mm -hmm. sorry, for the homeless. So maybe like this organization or their website might have more information. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I just Googled it and City Limits has the resource as well. Mm -hmm. um, that looks like DHS and also other departments that track mm -hmm. shelter. Well, maybe one thing to show is, so 421A, or replacement of, is back in the news. Um, maybe we can just show what some of the 421A um, yeah. properties are. This is all properties, and so 421A would be over here. Did you want, like, recent housing? Yeah, sure. This information, like, landlord or building specific. I don't think it's landlord specific. We do have the owner, well, sorry, uh, what, what, what information? Well, I can look like, you know, the landlord that was a Daniel over, over Shalom was arrested or there was a warrant out for his arrest. Mm -hmm. um, that's big news this past week. Yeah. So I'm just curious, like, was this landlord getting public dollars through any through LITAC, through the 421A, like that is very interesting to me to know like if on one hand he's been like a, a harassing and endangering tenants, has he also been get using public dollars and tax dollars that we're also paying for? And you know, this is something like HPD should know about because HPD funnels a lot of this federal and state money to these landlord programs to develop affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my biggest concerns, is like, are these landlords who are undermining affordable housing also getting, um, profiting mm -hmm. from public dollars? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I can take the first pass on this question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, in our core data interface, there is the owner name. Um, so this information is grabbed from Pluto, essentially, however, as you probably would notice when clicking through different properties, a lot of the owners are LLCs, which makes the tracking of the actual landlord really, really hard. Yeah. Yeah. But usually one umbrella organization mm -hmm. owns you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 LLCs, yeah. mm -hmm. so you would have to still search it by, you'd have to check the LLC against an LLC list that we may, yes. we may have. <laughs> <laughs> 
Can yeah. you help? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, done, I've done some work. <laughs> if you have the list of LLCs, we could help bridging like the Pluto data with the LLC data and try to find the actual BBL, like the property itself. Yeah, I have that too. <laughs> oh. It's here from JustFix, but the, yeah. the JustFix product runs why it also tracks that. Yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. That's a great question. Yeah. Just, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, is this data all at the building level? Is that like how many units there are in 421A or rent regulated buildings? Am I able to find that from your data? Or just is it just like individual bins or BBLs? No. Uh, so okay. I, it, it has to total number of units. Okay. Uh, probably in the physical, oh, sorry, maybe yeah. earlier like the total units available here. So that's at the building block lot level. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these properties, uh, the team compiled uh, like the affordable housing lottery data so that we have some information available actually added last year. So like you will see like income targeted units. Okay. Uh, and the, the, the data, like the main data source for this section is actually uh, the um, the housing lottery like website. Mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't compile like a list of income level and bedroom size, but we were able to make the at least the by bedroom size data available. So that's like income targeted units. But this information is not available for all properties. Only selected properties that we were able to scrape through the Housing <laughs> Connect lottery will have that information. And where it exists, is it all of the units in the building? Or would there be a time when some of the units would go into the lottery and there are other units that wouldn't come yet? That's another great question. So we only look at the first launch. So any unit that had a turnover will be launched as a mini lottery later on. Mm -hmm. Those are not coming okay. to, towards this, this section of the data. Some of these properties were actually one listing on Housing Connect website. So for those folks, uh, we don't have the like units available, like breakdown available at the property level, like at the PBL level. So those properties, they will have a link to the PDF file we have. So you can look at like these, properties, they were technically caught like one lottery listing on Housing Connect, and then you can see the like income targeted units available out there. Um, I was just wondering if you had historical data and so how far it goes back, because I would love to see how um, some size properties change over time. Um, that would be really, you have specific data on specific subsidies, so that would be really good. Um, not fun, but <laughs> <laughs> so like uh, may I paraphrase this question as like do we have historical snapshots and specific subsidized housing? Yes, we, we do have that available. Uh, the more comprehensive one in our uh, database is probably like early twenty eighteen, but we do have other. Um, data files that are not yet compiled into like a clean data set as the subsidized housing database. Uh, last year when I was doing some like housekeeping work on the data team, I do find like um, some HUD subsidy data like um, available at the development level that was dated early 2000s. So if you, you want to use that data, you can send an email to fermancenter.nyu.edu. And then we should be able to share any data that was publicly available to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, my question is around, like, has there been, like, a any kind of communication strategy or plan done to, like, let just let people know that this exists and that they can use it and that it's accessible to the public um and like if not how how can we let the people know 
Yeah, I can try to take a stab at that one. Um, so several times, so we just did a webinar um, a couple of months ago, I guess it was December, right, that we did one. Being here at the School of Data is like one way that we're trying to get this platform out in front of um, really smart people that are interested in really great questions. Um, but we're constantly also trying to, show, uh, you know, share this um, as often on, di on different platforms that, that we exist in. Obviously, we would love for you to share that, like, the core data exists, and, like, I think part of our hope today in going through the data journeys is also to get a sense of, like, what you're interested in and how you might use the tool, um, and if we do, uh, if we're able to do a share session in a little bit. But, yeah, we're trying very hard. Um, and. Uh, we at least have three, at least three um, opportunities across the year where we're trying to educate and share people, share this platform with others. Yeah, but thank you for being such a strong um, advocate. <laughs> oh, this is like so important. I, my, I have a, another question about like exactly what these programs mean for the tenant themselves. Um, obviously, there's any number of programs but like for instance if you find your the building that you live in on this on this database and this tool like what does that mean for you and what avenues do you think that they should be taking to find out more yeah well I feel I I don't think I can speak directly to that um, nor should I but I do know that there was a story what was it in the last couple of weeks um, that someone had found out that they were living do you know what I'm talking about? No, okay. Oh, it's squatter? No, no, not uh, a squatter. Um, she realized either that she was that she was paying less because of like whatever building that she was in. I'm sorry, I'm completely blanking on the specifics here. Um, but then went on TikTok and then shared her story so that other people in her building could know. Um, is this ringing any kind of bells? It, it yeah. was about getting your, uh, it's about finding out if your apartment was rent subsidized uh, or rent regulated right. so that, because she had got, been able to get a refund from her landlord right. by showing a history from one of the New York State entities, I forgot. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah, so yeah. we piece it together. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Together we know everything. Together we know everything, but yeah. Do you have, um, is there data about the value of properties and how quickly they, um, they are rising in certain uh, communities or in certain multifamily buildings because that too can be an indication of a lot of tenants being forced out very quickly because that gives rise to a rising property value. Um, so I'm just curious if that is reflected property values and how if, if they're you know rising more quickly than like in old buildings if they're rising more quickly than they really um, naturally would in a normal real estate environment yeah so uh, we don't necessarily report the like the the, the assessed property value to the tax uh, like the, the department of finance property tax systems but we have something that could reflect a market value of their property i mean like of certain properties in certain neighborhoods. So if we look at the sales data, um, so like the sales data metrics uh, could be like helpful indicator for you to look at. Uh, we report on median price, but also we have a uh, repeat sales housing price index uh, that is available uh, not only to neighborhoods, but also into some markets. But some of these uh, indexes <coughs> will like need to use with caution because in the like uh, some market and neighborhood cross cut, there aren't that many samples like repeat sales pairs because we rely on a property being transacted twice over time mm -hmm. in order to compute the sales price index. So like mm. uh, for neighborhood level, I would recommend go with like all property types, and then some market. Uh, indicators might be more helpful at the, like the borough level or citywide level. But in terms of just scoping, right, and getting mm -hmm. a sense of what might potentially be happening, but not necessarily be indicative of like what's yeah yeah like so, actual value yeah actual mm -hmm. value yeah. Okay. 
as we are helping troubleshoot the uh, access to the data uh, for for all other participants, we would like your feedback on Core Data website. So we prepared a uh, little survey for you, uh, and we would love your like participation in this survey to help inform our strategy on the next iteration of Core Data. So if you either scan the QR code here, it will lead you to a Google survey, or type in bit.ly core data NYC dash feedback, it will get you to the survey. Thank you so much. If you do it, you get Furman swag on the way out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, we have the Furman. Yeah, my landlord would love seeing that on the hallway. Yeah, <laughs> like, oh. we are constantly trying to improve, so any feedback you have for us would be greatly appreciated.